I'm going to need it up there because I have my, there it is. All right, with the Bibles in hand, let's uh, declare this together. This is my Bible. It is God speaking to me. I am who it says I am. I can do what it says I can do. I can have what it says I can have. So I open my heart today to hear God speak a word that will change my life forever. All right, you guys can be seated. Good morning, everyone. It's good to be in church, eh? It's good. I'm, I'm, I can't look at Braden. We match today, and it's... <laughs> Just throw me off. So he's looking in a weird mirror. It might look that way. Anyways, this is an exciting season. I love the fall. I really love the fall. And I feel like every time I preach, I preach in a different season, and I say I love that season because I guess I think I truly love every season. But with the fall for me, I just get really excited about the start of the fall. Uh, I'm a sports nut, and I, I don't know if there's any better time of the year than the start of the fall when, when NHL preseason's on and the NFL kicked off. And this year we have a Canadian team to cheer for in the Major League Playoffs for baseball. And it's just, it's a good season. I love sports. Uh, I'm also a pop culture nut, so it's the start of fall TV, and I keep track of all my shows who are returning. You know, just last Sunday I was at my parents' house. My dad and I were sitting down watching a football game and comparing notes on what shows we're going to watch this fall, which new shows are on. And, like, that was my happy place. It's like football on the screen. We're comparing, like, notes on what TV shows are starting. It's just a good, good time together. Um, and, I, I mean, I love coffee. You guys know that. And uh, I, I look forward to the fall for the return of the pumpkin spice latte. Does anybody else hear me on that one, right? So, and there's this beautiful thing where um, youth camp is, like, one of the highlights of the year for me. And for whatever reason, almost every year, the, the start of youth camp coincides with the release of the pumpkin spice latte. So as Eric and I get ready to go to camp and we're just so pumped for what God's going to do, we, like, go up there, like, with new latte in hands. It's, like, this perfect, like, melding of, like, the end of the summer and the start of the fall. And all that God is doing is, is wonderful. It's just wonderful. Um, but as a youth pastor, to get more spiritual here, um, youth, camp, youth camp marks the end of summer. And, and as a youth pastor, I love youth camp. And I love what God does in the lives of our kids. And I love the fact that we go into the fall with that momentum, with that push, with God just doing something amazing in their lives. And, and we have just amazing teenagers here at Sunshine Hills. And I was so impressed with how they showed up at camp this year and what God did in their lives and, and how they're coming out of camp and how they want to reach their friends and, and touch their schools and just be, be so in line with what God has for them. Uh, and I just love that kind of excitement going into the fall. And we had, for our fall kickoff, I'm going to brag for like a few seconds on youth if that's okay. For our fall kickoff, we had 50 teenagers here that night. Um, and not just to brag on youth, but J12 that night, too, had like 40, 50. They had a ton of people there. We had this building was packed out that night. We were running out of places to be. Um, but it's just been so great to see the momentum carrying into the fall and to see as we kick things off and the fall season begins that God is doing something amazing in our church, in the schools around us, in our teenagers, in our preteens. And I just love this time of year for just that, 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 that momentum and that push and that launch of the fall. And, and this year is very special in the sense, too, that we had our vision, our vision Sunday. The first time that we as a church came together to declare our vision, we see it there up there on the screen, that our vision is to be a dynamic local church that provides healing and wholeness for our local community through the transforming power of Jesus Christ. And that was, I believe, a defining day for our church as we rolled out this vision. We celebrate it together and we encourage one another to catch the vision and to walk forward in this. And then last week, Pastor Tom began to share, I think he said he was off his map last week, right? He was off his map. He began to share the fact that uh, the vision can't just be good-looking words on a screen or a beautiful wall in our foyer. The, the, the vision has to be words that we embrace and that we live out. So he began to talk about living the vision last week and the idea of a church as a field and a church as a force and that we truly live the vision when our church expands beyond these four walls makes a difference and an impact in our community and the lives of people around us. And this, this week, as I have a chance to share... And I, I shared this with Pastor Tom, and he was really like, yes, that's where we need to go. Go there. Uh, I want to take all of us a step forward in the implementation of our vision. I want to introduce a new, I guess, hashtag or catchphrase, and that is we need to be the vision. Not just catch a vision, not just live the vision. We need to be the vision. And for me, that looks like taking ownership of what God has called us as a church to do and finding our specific role to play in walking that out that we need to, as individuals, choose to be the vision, to embrace the vision, and to see what our role looks like in living that out. Now, I believe very, very specifically, very clear, that each one of you is uniquely created. That every single one of you is divinely inspired and created by God, and that you are special. And every single one of you has gifts and talents and abilities and character quir quirks that God has woven together into the unique person that you are. And that he has done that so that he, you can do specific things that he has in mind for you to do. And this week is where we begin to make things personal. I have some questions I want us to kind of walk away with this morning, um, questions we need to answer for ourselves. One is, what will you bring? 
Another one is what's in your hand. I'm going to unpack this as we go through this morning. But ultimately, how will we be the vision and move our local church forward into all that God has for us? This morning, I want to start in John chapter 6. You can turn. I'm going to tell a few stories from the Word this morning. Um, if you want to follow along, it's John chapter 6. We're going to start this morning. I want to talk about the feeding of the 5,000. And the question, what will you bring? I'm going to paraphrase most of these stories, but uh, for the feeding of the 5,000, what we see here is that great crowds at this time were following Jesus. That they had heard rumors or seen some of the miracles that he was doing, uh, and he, they had heard whispers of this radical teaching that he was bringing uh, to, to the world at that time. So these great crowds began to follow him because they were hoping, you know, if, if I can just you know, go where he's going today, maybe I can see something incredible. I can hear something radical. And I think some people were there for the right reasons. Some were just there for the spectacle and the show of it all. Um, but one day a problem presented itself in that it was getting late, and they're like, these people are really hungry. We've got to find a way to feed all these people that are following Jesus. I guess the disciples and Jesus kind of felt this responsibility. They came to hear Jesus speak and to see him share and to do miracles. You know, what are we going to do for them? Are we going to send them home hungry? What, like, are we going to provide for them? What are we going to do? And immediately as this problem presents itself, we see a divide in the mindsets of the disciples. Some of them right away went to the negative. They're like, there's no way. There's this, there's no way we can feed all these people like Jesus do you know how many are there? Like, if you counted them, like, there is no physical way we're going to feed these people. Uh, and it says that one disciple even spoke up, and he's like, in fact, if we gathered all the money here today, there's no way that all that money could even pay for enough food to go and buy food to feed everybody. It's, just, it's not happening. Like, we just got to send them home. They'll be okay. And we have other disciples that were on the more positive san- side of it, and they're like, it's Jesus. Like, we'll find a way. We'll find a way. And one of the disciples finds this young boy who had packed a lunch, five loaves of bread, two fish, and he says, hey, Jesus, this, this kid has some food. Like, can we see what happens if we, if we take this food? And the story goes on that Jesus takes these five loaves of bread and these two fish, and he gives thanks for the meal, breaks it, and begins to have his disciples hand out the food to the crowds. Now, I'm just thinking for a second, I love putting myself in the shoes of the disciples. I've followed Jesus for a little while now as a disciple, putting myself in their shoes. I've seen some crazy things, but I'm not sure what I would do if suddenly Jesus has five loaves and two fish and there's 5,000 people and he's like, start handing it out. I'd be like, sure, how are we going to make this work, Jesus? I'm not really sure what's going to happen here. But the story goes on that Jesus miraculously multiplied that food. And at the end of the story, he tells his disciples, you know, we're not going to waste anything, so grab some baskets. Let's go gather up the leftovers. We'll make sure we don't waste anything. And the story goes on to say that at the end of the day, they filled 12 baskets full of the leftovers of the miraculous multiplication of that food. There's a few things I want us to note in that story. Number one is the scope of the miracle. Just in case feeding 5,000 seems like too easy for any of you. Just in case you're like, ah, well, 5,000, Jesus, that makes sense. The scope of the miracle is this. Most uh, scholars would say that 5,000 probably only referred to the number of adult men in attendance that day. That's how they counted people in that day in that culture. So if you factor in the women and the children that are probably also there in attendance, you're looking more likely to number closer to 10,000 in the crowd that day. So just in case 5,000 was too small of a scope, it was probably 10,000 people that were hungry, okay? Second thing to note is the mindset of the boy. And this is me just kind of inferring some thoughts into the story. But if I'm going to go follow Jesus for the day, who doesn't pack a lunch? Like 10,000 people go, I'm just going to go follow Jesus for a day, and I'm not going to prepare for anything. Like, I mean, I have kids, so I guess I think that way. If I'm going out for the day, i got to pack like a diaper bag, i got to pack food, i got to pack stuff to bring with me. All these people go to follow Jesus. Nobody packs a lunch. One boy, though, one boy plans ahead. And there's, there's a principle there that I want us to catch. That one boy, he brought something to Jesus that day. The rest of the crowds just showed up and expected to be taken care of. And I think sometimes we assume that Jesus will provide everything, no matter what, rather than trusting that whatever small thing we have to bring, the miracle will begin to happen through that. In other words, I want to challenge us, when we show up to church, when we um, show up to minister, are we showing up to consume, to just be there and just let everything happen to us? Or are we showing up to be a contributor, bringing whatever little we have, whether we think it's the best or the least, and saying, God, this is what I have. Do something incredible with it. That boy figured, I got food. Let's see what happens. He showed up to contribute to the day and to give something of what he had to the greater miracle that God was going to do. 
And the third thing I want us to know is in this particular story is what does the boy do next? And the truth is, honestly, we don't know. Because once he gives his meal, we, never hear, we don't hear about him again in that story. And the principle there that I see is he gave his food to Jesus, and then he just got out of the way. And too often, I believe when we bring our gifts and our talents and our abilities and our lives to Jesus, we give them over, but we kind of like stand in the way and like block Jesus from doing stuff. We say, Jesus, you know what? Take my life. Take everything I have. It's all yours. Use it for you. Use it for your church. But please don't send me here. And I really, I don't really want to do this. Uh, in fact, I'd really like to do this over here. Is that cool? And we give our stuff to Jesus, but then we kind of like try to box him into how he can use us. And I'm not really sure that that is what Jesus is looking for. I want to encourage us this morning to allow him to use you in whatever way he has called you to be used. Give your gifts, your talents, your abilities to Jesus, and then we need to learn how to just get out of the way. Don't try to, to direct how God is allowed to use you. Just get out of the way and watch the miracle unfold as you walk in obedience to him, no matter what he calls or what he asks. The question being, what will you bring? What will you bring? Now, flipping your Bibles back, all the way to Exodus chapter 3, I want to look at another story in the Old Testament. Exodus chapter 3 is a story of when God appeared uh, in the burning bush and within flames of fire to speak to Moses. In this story, we see that God showed up in that bush to call Moses to lead his people out of slavery in Egypt into God's promised land. But at this point in history, Moses had actually run away from his people. He had been in Egypt, he had been there with his people in slavery, and then he ran away and was now living out in the wilderness, uh, working as a shepherd for his father-in-law. And in the midst of this circumstance, working as a shepherd for his father-in-law in the wilderness, away from his people, away from the slavery in Egypt, God calls Moses to go back to the place he'd run away from to be the leader to his people. And we see throughout the conversation that Moses throws every single excuse in the book back at God. When God calls him, he has an answer and excuse for every single thing. Moses is like, honestly, like, who am I to lead Israel? Like, I, I am not your guy. Like, I'm just not him. I'm a terrible speaker, first of all. Like, I guess I stutter and I mumble and I just can't talk clearly. So, like, I'm not the leader. Like, I can't talk. And second of all, no one will believe me that a burning bush talked to me. So, like, that's right out the window. And even if they did believe me, no one's going to listen to me because, once again, I'm a terrible speaker. He just kind of, like, goes over, over all his excuses over and over and over and over again. And finally says, you know what, God, just, just please send someone else. Like, just find, there's got to be someone else in Israel. Just find someone else, not me. I'm out. I don't want any part of this. In the midst of this back and forth between God saying, Moses, you need to go back, and Moses saying, no, not me, God interrupts Moses, and he asks Moses this one question. He says, Moses, what's in your hand? And as a shepherd, there was something very specific in Moses' hand at that time, and that was the shepherd's staff. Symbolic of who Moses was, what his calling in life was at that point in time, symbolic of the, the, the job he had, the profession he was a part of, the shepherd's staff is an important tool of any shepherd. And what we see next, God says, Moses, what's in your hand? A staff. And then God says, Moses, I want you to throw it on the ground. I want you to take that thing that represents who you are. I want you to toss it on the ground. And immediately the story says that the staff became a snake, which terrified Moses because, let's be honest, if you have something in your hand you throw it on the ground, it becomes a snake. That's probably going to terrify most of us. <laughs> and then God says, hey, by the way, that thing that gets turned into a snake, why don't you grab the snake now? Moses was like, no, thank you. And Moses is like... God says, grab it by the tail. So Moses grabs his tail and says, as soon as he touched the tail, it turned back into a staff. I want us to catch this point. That I believe that God will often ask us to throw down what defines us as a sign of surrender so that he can take what we have and what we are and do something miraculous with it. I want to say it again because I want to make sure we don't miss that. I believe that God will often ask us to throw down what defines us as a sign of surrender, so that he can take what we have and what we are and do something miraculous with it. So I ask the question, what's in your hand? To take this story into a modern context, Rick Warren is the pastor of Saddleback Church in, in the U.S. He's a famous pastor. Many of you probably read Purpose Driven Life, bestseller for a very long time. Uh, a number of years back, Rick Warren was invited to go to the NBA All-Star Game. And he was given an opportunity to speak to the players that were assembled there for NBA All-Star Weekend. Now, these are the very best of the best in the NBA. Like, if you were a good basketball player, scratch that. If you were a great basketball player, you're invited to the NBA All-Star Game. So this is the very best of the best of what the NBA has to offer. And Rick Warren was given a chance to share with these incredible men. And he shared this same story of Moses in the burning bush. And he went on to say that he asked the players there that day, 
what's in your hand? And the answer was very simple. They all had a basketball in their hands, they're basketball players. And the point, Rick Warren's point was this, whether they acknowledged God or not, God had blessed each one of them with the ability to play basketball like no other person. Because of that, they each had tremendous influence in both media and in culture and a voice to speak to people that other people, uh, that, that um, some people would not listen to others, but they would listen to them because they were famous. They had incredible influence, incredible voice. And Rick said, how are you going to use this influence? You have this basketball, which represents this influence and this power that you have over media and culture. How will you use that? What's in your hand? Will you give all glory back to God or will you hog it for yourselves? Will you recognize where your gifts came from or are you just going to credit yourself with how great you are? Will you use this influence you've been given to make a positive impact in the lives of others and in your communities? Or are you just going to choose to take all that money that you've been given and just live large with the best cars and the best houses and the best everything and just hoard it all for yourselves? Rick Warren looks at these men and says, what's in your hand? And he challenged them there that day to take what God had given them, the profession that they had, and use it to make a positive impact in the world around them. So I ask us here today, what's in your hand? What do you do? What defines who you are? What gifts, talents, and abilities has God given you? And most importantly, once we've identified those things, what is God asking you to do with those? So break this down a little bit more. I believe that God creates within us innate talents and abilities, certain tasks and activities that we are each naturally very good at. And I also believe that in addition to these natural talents and abilities, that when we come into a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, when we declare him as Lord and Savior, the Holy Spirit takes up residence in our life. And that through the Holy Spirit, God desires to release in each and every one of our lives a variety of spiritual gifts and spiritual abilities. These are aptitudes that are born not from the natural, but from the supernatural. Now, natural talents are things like artistic ability, athletic ability, things that you're naturally born with, you're good at. They can be uh, trained and developed, and you can increase in how good you are at them. But natural talents, athletic ability, artistic ability, maybe you're good at cooking, baking, that's not me, but natural talents and abilities. Then there's things like spiritual gifts, uh, prophecy, healing, miracles, speaking other languages. These are spiritual gifts that God gives to his church. Now, I believe that our natural talents and abilities are where we begin to answer these questions, what will I bring and what's in my hand? Because these are the things that we are naturally born with and naturally gifted with, things that that are part of who we are. And I believe that spiritual gifts are the supernatural abilities that come from the Holy Spirit, which God desires to unleash in each and every one of our lives. And here's the really cool thing in my mind. The combination of your natural talents and abilities with the gifts that God wants to release in your lives that are spiritual, these things coming together create your natural, your gift mix, your unique gift mix, the natural and the spiritual coming together into a a unique gift mix that God has given you. Because of that gift mix, every single one of us have a specific role to play in the body of Christ because you have a specific gift mix unique to you and to your area of influence. And I believe that God will always specifically equip us for the calling that he has in our life. He will never call you to do something that he will not equip you to be able to do in his power. So wherever you're being called to, he's equipped you to do that. Now, I recognize that for some of us here this morning, as I talk about things like spiritual gifts and abilities, uh, some of us may understand what I mean by that. Some of us may not. So if you'll allow me a brief tangent, I want to do a little bit of teaching just very quickly on on what spiritual gifts and abilities look like as we see in the Word. So spiritual gifts are divine abilities distributed by the Holy Spirit to every believer according to God's design and grace for the common good of the church. That's a long definition, so I will say that again, and I'll break it down. Spiritual gifts are divine abilities distributed by the Holy Spirit to every believer according to God's design and grace for the common good of the church. So what is a spiritual ability or a spiritual gift? Is it a divine ability? Is something that is born not from the natural but from the spiritual? Who is able to use these? The Bible is very clear that these are gifts given to every single believer. That when you accept Jesus, the Holy Spirit comes into your life. And if we simply ask, God wants to release these spiritual gifts and abilities in our lives. How does this happen? The Bible is very clear. It happens through the work of the Holy Spirit. And it's according to God's design and according to his grace. The Bible says that some some many are given and some few are given, but God has a unique design uh, for each of your lives. It has a unique purpose. And according to that purpose and design, he will gift you with the gifts that you need to walk out what he's called you to do. The big question probably is, well, why? Why why do we need these, like, you know, spiritual superpowers? We were talking with the girls in the drive here this morning, and... um, Addie was asking 
uh, if God could do everything and all these questions about who God was and what he can do. And, and I was just like, yeah, you can, because like, that's like God's superpower. Like, he can just do those things. It's God. And I was like, oh, you're awesome, Audrey. Uh, but for some of us, it's easy to break it down. Like, we, we recognize, like, these, these constructs of superpowers and superheroes that's so part of our culture that sometimes this idea of spiritual gifts and abilities seems so out there. But really, to bring it into, like, a, a common term, it's superpowers. It's actually things that God has gifted us with so that we can walk in the calling that he has for us. And I figure if a child in the backseat of a van can understand, yeah, it's God's superpowers that he gives to us, then we can get it too, right? Uh, so why does God give this? It says very clear, for the common good of the church, we are given these gifts, A, to encourage other believers, to encourage the church as we gather together, but also to reach those who are not yet believers. The Bible talks at length this idea of one body and many parts, and we recognize that our physical bodies are these amazing creations made up of, of thousands upon thousands of music, moving parts and bones, and I mean, I just can't even begin to compromise how it's going to work, else my head's going to hurt. But we are one body, yet many parts. The Bible it says in Scripture that as a church worldwide, the church of Christ is one body but many parts. And each of us make up this body of Christ. And Paul teaches us that because of that, we each have a specific role to play. And he says in 1 Corinthians 12, you know, if in your body your eye can't say to your hand, like, I'm done seeing today, like, just I'm, I'm checking out for a little bit. Or your finger can't say to your foot, like, have fun walking, but I'm not picking anything up. That we are one body, many parts that works together in unity. In the same way, the body of Christ is one body, many parts, and we need to recognize we all have a role to play, and we don't really get the option to say, I'm checking out for now, or else the body doesn't work and function properly, that we each need to step into what God's called us to do and play the role that he's called us to play. One body, many parts. Now, spiritual gifts are mentioned by the new t- uh, in the New Testament by the authors a number of times. To this morning, I want to look at two sections of Scripture that are probably the most common sections that we go to when we talk about things like spiritual gifts. So let's uh, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. We'll start there. And I apologize, I don't have the words on the screen. Um, When I work with teenagers, I want them to bring their Bibles, so (laughs) I never put the words up because they have to bring their Bibles and read it for their own, so you get a little bit of my youth pastor coming out this morning. But uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, we're going to pick up there uh, in this idea of spiritual gifts. Paul writes in verse 1, Now about spiritual gifts, brothers, I do not want you to be ignorant. So right off the bat, Paul tells the church, I don't want you guys to be ignorant about this. I want you to know about this. This is something that God wants us to know about and understand and, and, and walk out in. Down to verse 4. There are different gifts, different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but the same God works all of them in all men. Verse 7. Now to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. To one there is given through the Spirit the message of wisdom, to another the message of knowledge by means of the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by that one Spirit, to another miraculous powers, to another prophecy, to another distinguishing between spirits, to another speaking different kinds of tongues or languages, and still to another the interpretation of tongues or languages. All these are the work of one and the same Spirit, and he gives them to each one just as he determines." This is kind of the list of the traditional spiritual gifts. We see in this things like wisdom, knowledge, faith, healing, miracles, prophecy, discernment, languages, and the interpretation of languages, both earthly and heavenly. That most often, if you've been around church for any length of time, when we say things like spiritual gifts, this is mostly where our head goes to. This is the list that we remember from Sunday school, from youth group. Uh, And we don't necessarily have the time this morning, unfortunately, to walk through what each one looks like. But I have some resources if you're interested. I'll talk about that in a second. Uh, these are the traditional spiritual gifts, things that in our natural ability we would be unable to do unless we're just putting on a show or putting on a, a fake front. But God, through his Holy Spirit, gives us the ability to have these, this divine insight, divine ability to walk in things like wisdom, knowledge, he- healing, miracles. That through the power of the Holy Spirit and wor- at work in our lives, we're able to step out in these spiritual gifts, both for the encouragement and the betterment of our local church and to reach those who are far from Christ. Now turn to uh, Romans chapter 12. Paul has a second list for us of gifts here in Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12, verse 4. In this, in this book, Paul has a slightly different list. He says, Just as each one of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we who are many form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given us. If a man's gift is prophesying, let him serve it, use it in, y- let him use it in proportion to his faith. If it is serving, let him serve. If, if it is teaching, let him teach. If it is encouraging, let him encourage. If it is contributing to the needs of others, let him give generously. If it is leadership, let him govern diligently. If it is showing mercy, let him do it cheerfully. 
And we see here gifts that are slightly different. The ones in 1 Corinthians speak very clearly of actions, things that we step out in like wisdom or knowledge, specific things for a specific time. We see here uh, a whole different list of gifts, things like teaching and leadership, things that um, often are there in the natural and then spiritually God gets kind of super, supersizes them, makes them more effective. And I had a pastor once that, that I greatly respect. He described this list of gifts in Romans 12 as the playground gifts. What he means by that is this, that if you go to any playground and watch kids play, you will see these gifts in action. Now think of it for a second. Picture in your head a bunch of kids playing on a playground, playing a game, whatever. You can tell who has leadership gift because the kid, they, are, they are the kid bossing everybody else around. All right? You can tell who has the teaching gift because they're the kid trying to help all the other kids understand how to play the game they're trying to play. You can tell which kid has the mercy gift because when one kid falls in and bumps their knee, that's a kid going over going, oh, are you okay? You get gift of mercy, right? You can tell who has the uh, encouragement gift because they're just like, you guys are doing awesome. You're awesome. I love you. You can tell who has the, uh, the gift of prophecy because that's a kid sitting on the sidelines going, I'm telling you, this is not going to end well. Like, I, I see where this is going. This is not going to end well, right? The kid with the gift of giving, he's the one who shares his lunch with everybody else and goes home hungry. I mean, you just, you go to a playground, you look at kids, you see these gifts in action. And it's fun to picture, but when, when, um, when, when that was shared with me, I guess I realized, like, that is, that is so true. These are not, you know, strange ethereal gifts that are hard to understand. These are gifts, if you look at a child playing, you can see these gifts in action. And I say that because I think too often we, we read about these spiritual gifts in the Scripture and we go, oh, that's, that's too far out there. Like, I don't understand that. I can't grasp that. It's too weird. It's too spiritual. It's too ethereal, whatever. But these are gifts that have a very practical application. They're gifts that are not, not meant to be weird or spooky. They're gifts that God gives us for the encouragement of others to bring people closer to him and to help us uh, grow in our faith and to trust him more. And they're not supposed to be things we don't understand. They're things that are supposed to be very easy to grasp. Now, this, of course, is a very brief intro on spiritual gifts because, goodness knows, you could probably do an entire weekend conference on spiritual gifts. Um, but I do want to encourage you, if you're interested in learning more about these spiritual gifts, our church has have a number of resources available. Uh, currently, right now, on our Monday Night Youth program, we're going through spiritual gifts with our teenagers. And one of the things that we do is I have these spiritual gift assessments that I hand out. It's a, uh, quite a thick package of like 140 statements. And it's very simple. It's, just, it's statements that you just put a number next to, like, that's very true of me, that's not very true of me, that's somewhat true of me, that's never true of me. And as you begin to just kind of score these statements out, they have a, a scoring table. It begins to just show you uh, very easy, easily what gifts are highlighted in your life, what gifts you naturally gravitate towards based on your personality and mixture and, and what you enjoy and don't enjoy, and, and what gifts are really not what you have. Uh, so I want to encourage you, if you've never taken one of those, uh, I'll be more than willing to print a whole bunch off and just pass them out. They're able to be reproduced for free. Uh, and they're, they're a huge booklet that kind of goes deeper into what these look like. They get some explanations for each of the gifts, get some scripture, scripture references and some more teaching on what these are meant for. Uh, so if anybody would like some of those, you can feel free to message me or message Pastor Tom, talk to me after the service. Um, but I encourage us as a church to really press into this and to discover what God's gifted us with and what spiritual gifts he wants to release in our lives. Now I guess back on track as we wrap up here this morning. I do believe that each one of you have natural talents and abilities. I think every single person has something that God's given them unique that they can bring to the table. And in addition to your natural talents and abilities, God eagerly desires to release in every single one of your lives a unique mix of spiritual gifts. And this combo of your natural talents and abilities and your spiritual gifts creates this personal gift mix. And I truly believe that when each one of us puts our personal gift mix into practice, that is when we become the vision. That's when we truly be the vision and live it out. What talents do you have that could benefit the ministry of our local church? What abilities is the Holy Spirit even now stirring up inside of you? And how will you put your personal gift mix into practice? And I guess draw down a few ideas. I mean, some of you may be really good with computers and technology. And perhaps you are good with that naturally, but you also have the spiritual gift of teaching. We desperately need people that can make everything back there work in such a way that we can teach it to other people that maybe don't grasp it as easily as some of you do. So if you have this natural ability of technology and working with computers and you have the ability to teach others, there's a place for you to serve. Perhaps you love to cook and bake and you also have the spiritual leadership, leader, uh, gift of leadership. I trust that, that God will begin to put in our lives uh, visions of going outside of these four walls and creating programs that can feed people and to give food to people and to bless people that don't have the food that we uh, so easily gain. Perhaps you naturally just love kids and are good at working with them and you have the spiritual gift of encouragement. There are so many areas in our church to serve with kids and to just love on kids and to encourage them. And perhaps you're really good with working with your hands. That's not me. 
at all, but some of you are good with working your hands, and maybe you have the spiritual gift of giving, and maybe God's calling you to build some things and to create some things you can just give away free of charge to bless other people. And those are just four things that I just jotted down really quickly on a Friday afternoon, and I truly believe that the possibilities of how we can plug in and serve our church and serve our community are endless when we step into all that God has called us to be. I'll close with this. Did you know that Christmas is just around the corner? Like, just around the corner. Like, it's almost there. Like, I love the fall, but Christmas is coming, and I'm really stoked about Christmas. Here's the thing, though. I am one of those parents, and some of you when you were kids may have hated these kind of parents, but I'm one of those parents that na- in the natural, I don't really want my kids to unpackage their brand new toys on Christmas morning. I'll explain for a second, because you probably all think I'm crazy. We have a lot of people on Christmas morning, both when we celebrate Christmas with my family and we celebrate Christmas with Erica's family. There's a lot of people present there. Uh, and you know what? There, it can be really easy for a new gift to get broken with that many kids in the house or for, like, new things to get lost. So I just figure, you know what, kids? Like, I'm really glad you love all your new presents, but wouldn't it be awesome if you just kind of, like, put them aside for the day and just, like, put them over there in the nice, like, shiny packaging and just, like, didn't play with them today? Like, that would just make me really happy as your dad to just not lose anything or break anything today. That would be awesome. I'm that parent. I'm the big killjoy on Christmas morning. It's like, sorry, girls. We'll just keep all your Barbies over there. Don't lose anything. Don't let any male steal it. Just, Thankfully, Eric is not that parent. So uh, our kids do have fun on Christmas. I don't ruin it for them. But this is the point. Gifts are completely useless if you don't play with them. Gifts are useless if they sit on the shelves. Gifts are useless if you never unpackage them. God has given you natural talents and abilities. God wants to release and unleash spiritual gifts inside of you, but they are completely useless if they sit on the shelf. We need to learn to take our gifts out of their packaging. And we need to learn to take what God has given us and then lay it at his feet and say, God, use me. Take what you've given me and do something amazing in my life. Our gifts, our talents, our bills, they can't get sit on the shelf. We need to be willing to be used. We need to be the vision that our church has for our community and for our church. Let's pray. God, thank you for this morning. God, thank you. You have created this amazing mix of individuals. Every single person here has talents and abilities and giftings and things that you have uniquely created them to be. And God, I pray that this morning we would just feel the stirring inside of us to be used by you. God, I truly believe that the most powerful prayer that we can ever pray is two words, and that is, use me. God, I pray as a church this morning that we would pray that prayer, that we would say, God, use me. Whatever it looks like, whatever you're calling me to, God, I lay my th- everything you've given me back at your feet. God, would you use me? God, I pray for those this morning that sit here and aren't really quite sure what they've been gifted with or what you want to unleash in their life. God, I pray that you would reveal to us this morning what you've given us. God, I pray that you would reveal in each life this morning uh, what we're good at, what we're called to do, what's in our hand, what we can bring. God, I pray that you would show us how we can plug what we have into our church's vision. God, I pray that you would reveal to us how we can be used, how we can serve, how we can serve within the walls of our church, and how we can serve outside of our walls for our local community. God, I pray that we each would truly step up and embrace the call to be the vision, to be that dynamic local church that impacts people here and all over the place. And God, I pray that this one would be encouraging. Not that it would be uh, condemning or, or um, making anybody feel that they don't have anything. I truly believe that every single person here has something to bring, something to give. So God, I pray that each person here would be encouraged, you know, that they have a role to play, they have a place to plug into in our local church. God, thank you that you love us so much. You invite us to be a part of establishing your kingdom here on earth. And last thing, you guys can keep your eyes closed and your heads bowed. We do this every single Sunday. We want to give an opportunity for anyone here who does not know Jesus to make that decision here this morning. So with every eye closed and every head bowed, if you're here this morning and you have not yet made a decision uh, to ask Jesus into your life, to make him your Lord and your Savior, if you would just slip your hand up, I'd love to pray with you. I'd love to acknowledge that decision. Is there anyone here this morning? All right, so guys, we come to a conclusion this morning. We just thank you so much that you want us to be a part of what you're doing. God, I pray for just blessing on every single person here, wherever life takes them this week, Lord God, would you bless them? Would, they imp- would you empower them? Would you give them courage and boldness to speak of you? In Jesus' name, amen. Stand with me. Thank you guys for coming this morning. I hope you were blessed and encouraged. Good day to be in church. Uh, there's things to sign up for at the back. Time to hang out and spend time with your friends. Have a great day, everyone. See you later.